All right then, hello people. Uh, welcome to our seminar. This is Milad Rasaymanesh and I'm gonna be the moderator and the host of the today's seminar. The title of our online, uh, online seminar for today is like end sexual apathy. Uh, as you guys most probably know, we're getting close to the March the 8th, International Women's Day. We having a couple of seminars and end sexual apathy is one of them. You, you all very welcome to the seminar. Uh, today, uh, we have uh, six panelists, uh, which would have a quick talk uh, about the topic they have chosen. Uh, and then um, on the next part of the seminar, I'm going to ask some questions uh, from the audiences. So hopefully, they would answer my questions. Uh, as you guys know, the program is broadcasted live through Facebook and YouTube. So feel free to express yourself, ask questions, or anything you would like to point out through the comments. Uh, I will show the good comments on the screen. Please make sure that you put the comment as short as you can. So basically I can put them in the screen while the speakers and the panelists are talking. Uh, I would like to welcome everyone, uh, the six panelists for today. Uh, first of all, I would like to point out uh, Khulud Al-Harithi uh, is sick today. So it's so sad she couldn't make it. Uh, we missing uh, her. She was supposed to be one of our panelists. And Varud Zahir is not here so far. Hopefully, she would join us in continue the during the during the seminar. All right then. Uh, hi everyone. Uh, I'm talking to panelists right now. Good to have you all here today. Uh, we have like a family of faces over here. Good to have you all. The first speakers would be Lilith. Uh, she lives in Germany from Köln. So basically, in this seminar, I would like to give the chance to the panelists to introduce themselves and let the audiences let the audiences know who they really are, and then um, then they can just start uh, their speech, whatever they would like to talk about. One last point before I just give the mic to Lilith. Uh, I would like to point out the seminar going to be in English and in German language. So for those of you watching the program through the uh, page of Central Committee of Ex-Muslim in Germany, uh, feel free to put comments in German if you like. All right, Lilith, uh, good to have you around. Uh, you're the first panelist. Uh, would you like introduce yourself first of all? And second of all, start your speech. The floor is yours, Lilith. Uh, thank you, Milad. Um, I'm so great uh, for, for you to have me once again uh, on this panel especially about the sexual apartheid. So I am living in Germany um, for the last eight years, and I have been working with people uh, with migrant and refugee backgrounds. And uh, I'm working with queer women, I'm working with the LGBTI community, and I'm also a board member of a couple of organizations that are working with, uh, with migrants and refugees, as well as a couple of organizations which are working for uh, women of migrant and refugee origins. So uh, that's my short introduction. Uh, other than that, uh, the the topic that we have today, it's talk about gender apartheid uh, and the sexual apartheid. And uh, as I uh, come from a Muslim background, and I have also a deep knowledge about how the society works in my home country, which is Pakistan. So I will talk mostly about the sexual apartheid um, reasons uh, in a society like Pakistan, in my home country. What are the reasons, what are the justifications that are put forward by different um, parts of the society that the women are not given the equal chances? So I will start uh, generally what is uh, gender or sexual apartheid. It's the economic and social or sexual discrimination against individuals because of their gender or sex. Oh, and it is a system enforced by using either physical or legal practices to relegate individuals to subordinate positions so that the entire society is divided into uh, first class citizens, which are usually men, and then the second class citizens, which are women. And women of all kind, uh, they could be queer women, they could be cisgender, transgender women, it doesn't matter. And the problem is, because of this gender apartheid, it leads not only to social as well as economic disempowerment of individuals, but rather it also leads to severe physical harm 
in many cases. So the personal status and the laws and the criminal codes that are applied to women are driven mostly from the Quran, which is the basic pillar or the basic source of uh, uh, lawmaking in most of the Muslim societies. So I will go one by one. For example, in Surah 4, verse 11, um, Allah talks about that the male shall have the equal of the portion of two females. So a male has double share than a female. Why? Uh, he's better. And then uh, there is this about court testimony, which I find really uh, amazing as I was studying Islam back in uh, 2003 and 2004. <laughs> and call two witnesses from among your men. Um, and if two men be not found, then a man and two women. So if it's uh, like, if you don't have uh, men at all, then it has to be four women. Or maybe if you have just men, then only two. So once again, the testimony is also double uh, the amount of testimony that a woman can give. And then in Quran, in Surah uh, 2, verse number 228, uh, Allah says, and the men are a degree above women. So they are better. <laughs> then further Quran says that in Surah 5, uh, verse number 6, and if you are unclean, now I'm coming towards that women are also unclean, especially when they are uh, going through their periods. Purify yourself. And if you are sick or on a journey or one of you come from the closet or you have had contact with women and you find no water, then go to clean to the high grounds and rub your face and your hands with some of it. So if you are going to touch a woman, who is not clean, who is going through her periods, and you have become unclean because of that, just by touching her, uh, you should go and rub some um, uh, some dust on your faces that is going to purify you. So anyways, uh, you can imagine what kind of uh, things are going on. Then Quran further says in Surah 2, 223, your wives are a tilt unto you. So approach your tilt when or how you will. So tilt, for those people who uh, might find it a bit uh, Shakespearean English, tilt is a piece of land where you can plow and you can have your own fields. So women are like equivalent of fields, like they are your property. Go and have sex with them the way you want and whenever you want. If even they say no, then there are some certifications in Ahadith which says, oh, you can actually, uh, if you are going to say no, then the angels are going to curse you the entire night. Yeah, good. I don't want that, <laughs> having a curse. Then it goes further. It says that marry women of your choice in Surah 4 and verse number 3, 2 or 3 or 4. So a man can marry up to four women. That's also a justification of showing, yeah, I can have four women, but you can't have more than one man. So polygamy is allowed, but uh, polyandry is not allowed. Then I will say one, uh, two more examples. In Surah 53, verse number 27, those who believe not in the hereafter, name the angels with female names. So if you do not believe in hereafter, you are disgracing uh, by calling angels with female names. So calling them with female names is also not good. Call them with male names like Gabriel, like Michael, like uh, Archangel, uh, the other Archangels. And last but not the least, in Surah 4, verse number 24, as well as Surah number 33, verse number 50, a man is permitted to take women as sex slaves outside of marriage. And those are called those whom the right hand possesses. So you have wives with, with whom you have a marriage. And then you can also have captive women, which are slaves. And many people don't know that, that uh, the Holy Prophet of Islam, Muhammad, he also had a captive slave woman, Maria Kiptia. And from without marrying her, he had a son with her, Ibrahim. So you can see uh, how it actually started. Uh, the basis of apartheid. 
So all these examples are a testimony to the fact how women are the weaker sex and have been discriminated with an excuse that women have been created lesser than men. Thus, any Muslim majority countries treat women as second class citizen, especially if you are women of different economic class as well as from different caste, uh, profession, or even as a religious minority, the women is the weaker sex and almost always exploited. Many people, especially the apologists, uh, will argue that Islam is diverse, the Islam practiced in Germany is different than the Islam practiced in Pakistan, which I agree. But they either forget to tell that Islam draws its basic principles of a society from Quran, or they just don't want to tell us that. And then ahadis are added to it, and sirah of the Holy Prophet is also added to it. So it depends from state to state and country to country. But they also forget to tell us one more thing, that there are three Islamic countries in the world which are called Islamic Republic. One is Pakistan, the other one is Mauritanian, and then the Iran. They make laws according to the Islamic principles. And Pakistan has also in its constitution that all law making has to be in conform with the Islamic teachings. So however they are going to uh, interpret the Islamic teachings, that's up to them. But what we see in practice is that those Islamic teachings, at least the one mentioned in Quran, are not even debatable. And many love to argue that you can interpret the verses differently. But when it comes to women rights and equity of genders, there are always harsher interpretations for women and female persons and more power and liberty and freedom for men. So yeah, I will end there and I will ask uh, my colleague, Maryam. Uh, she's also from Pakistan and she can more talk about her experience living as a woman uh, as a woman in pakistan and how these different kind of apartheid practices actually affected her life thank you yeah, thank, thank you, you just give me a second I'm, i will i will come to you Maya, in a minute thank you yeah, lily yeah. it's always great to listen to your speech you have a great um intelligent sense of humor and shakespeare -y sort of english which is cool i like it Thank you, Lily. Uh, the next speaker is going to be Mariam, as Lily mentioned. But before that, Varud is here. Hi, Varud. Welcome to the seminar. Great to have you. You were late, but you're here. Awesome to have you around. All right, Mariam, sorry for interrupting you. It's your turn. Uh, the floor is yours. Hello. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, I am uh, Mariam from Pakistan, and I am currently uh, doing my PhD uh, from Germany for the past two and a half year almost. And I'm also sort of a uh, um, social activist because uh, I run a page on fa Facebook, um, uh, which is basically about uh, these subtle incidents of misogyny and gender bias. And yeah, it discusses these uh, in, in, in uh, it's a basically a sarcastic page. So moving on to the, um, um, topic uh, of today uh, i will take um, i will put forth my points um, in extension to what uh, lilith already said um, uh, i will quote some incidents from my life and also some research based data which actually proves that um, all of these uh, religious um, uh, all of the things that are mentioned in religion are also like then very seriously extended onto social life and also in our day-to-day -day life. Uh, for example, um, like uh, it reminds me that uh, for me, gender apartheid started from very early on childhood because I remember uh, um, my sister was once cycling in a uh, in my grandparents' village and some uh, middle-aged man literally ran towards her to just hit her and she was a child she was not um, i think she must have been like 10 or 10 years old and that man literally ran towards her in a very uh, angry face shouting that how why, why are you even cycling he he sort of knew who she is but then his point was that if my girls will see you cycling around uh, they can like ruin she, you can ruin my daughters or uh, the other girls of the village. So just, you know, I where, wherever it is that you come from, keep it to yourself. And then there were various incidents of 
me and my other sisters not really being allowed to fly kites especially in on the rooftops because then everyone can see that oh girls are flying kites and it's something of a um, it's, it's a recreational activity that is associated with boys so uh, the point that i'm trying to make is that gen the gender apartheid and restricting spaces and experiences for, for women it actually really starts really early on as a child in in your childhood and not um, and it like sort of intensify intensifies when you hit puberty so um extending on to that most recently uh, i have i was um, i went through a divorce last year and then again uh, for men um it's just uh, uh, the terminology of the the terminology for men is different like according to court they can give the give you the divorce but according to the pakistani court and law a woman has to either demand separation or she can at the time of marriage she can get it written on the paper that she has a right to demand um separation so this is actually what i did i had to uh, formally request the court to um, uh, grant me uh the divorce and then it just doesn't end here i got the paper finally but it just doesn't end here i had to uh, uh i i still need to change my passport and my uh, uh pakistani identity card because instead of my father's name i had to they, they i had to first get it changed to my husband's name my ex husband's name so for me it has been like uh, back and forth getting i think i'm going to get a third passport uh, in in a few months first uh, was my original one which said which mentioned my father's name and then there's another one um, uh, which i had to get renewed which specifically had to mention my husband's name and also with the uh, id card so yeah i am and um, recently um, so i mean i i actually read an article somewhere some time back that if if uh, so what happens if a girl or a woman is married like three or four times and divorced three or four times uh, the pakistani passport office or the national identity card office becomes her regular go to place that she has to get it changed again and again so um, uh, yeah uh, also and um, there was a uh, um, uh, some common friend of ours who actually went on to uh, get uh, through the office to get these details fixed and she sort of argued with the uh, the national identity card office place and they said that there is no other way around it this is just the way it is it, it doesn't matter if you want to keep your father's name on your passport that does not matter you have to keep your husband's name it, uh, and obviously your family number change changes as well the place where you uh, actually go on to vote during elections also changes as well so if uh, for example uh, my play, uh, my go to place where i was supposed to vote was my grandfather was my father's village or my grandfather's village like my family village it it was it was then changed to the city where i was married to this man so yeah basically um i mean the way that i look at it uh, your identity or even your right to vote actually sort of moves around and depends with the man that you are married to and also uh, extending on to this um, i recently heard a news uh, that uh, the uh, one of the major banks of pakistan they made it compulsory for a woman to uh, get two six signatures from men in order to have a uh, uh, a credit card or a bank uh, uh, in order to open a bank account mm -hmm. so this actually extends on to what lilith was explaining earlier that uh, since women are considered since women are women are considered like half of that of men in terms of their um, comprehensive cap capabilities or their brain or their worth or whatever it is uh, you actually need two you actually need two men or probably i don't know four women to get a uh, uh, bank account so yeah it takes a whole village 
to do that. Yeah, yeah. Thank uh, you very much, Maya. Yeah. Thank you. Um, you can continue in the, like a second part. Uh, sorry, about, sorry about that, but like time is up. Thank you for your speech. Uh, thank you for the information you shared. Um, before I uh, move on to the next speaker, which is Shami, uh, I would like to point out again, guys, this is a live program. You can put comments or ask questions. So please feel free to express yourself through comments. I see the live chat is so quiet. Uh, make sure that you put comments or ask questions. All right, then we move on. Uh, Shami, you're the next speaker. Can you please introduce, like give us a short biography and then start your speech. The floor is yours. Thanks, Milad, and uh, thanks for the invitation. So uh, this is Shami Haq. I'm from Bangladesh. Um, since five years, I live in Germany in exile. In 2015, I had to leave my country. Um, I, I was in hit list from Islamist several group and five blogger friend of mine, they were killed. And after a lot of things, um, I had to come to Germany. So now I work as a journalist for one of the biggest German uh, newspaper, and I write about women rights and uh, human rights. So today I want to talk about, um, of course, uh, my experience, what I lived in Bangladesh, and my experience with this sexual apartheid, and also in general, how is the situation in Bangladesh? Um, because Bangladesh is not so popular here. People do not know, do not know that much about Bangladesh. So I will just focus in general and my experience. So I um, grew up, I'm also an ex-Muslim and I grew up uh, in a Muslim family. Luckily they were not so strict, but of course our society, our neighbors, there were a lot of people who are very conservative and um, I grew up uh, without my father and in our society, not having a man in your family, it's kind of like a um, punishment. People do not treat you a um, good way. And so, um, uh, and Bangladesh uh, is not an Islamic country, but 90% are Muslim. So we have a huge impact from this Islamic uh, Islamic perspective, and of course, um, like like everywhere, women women is uh, women are always victim, and we have also Hinduism, Christian uh, Christians and Buddhism, but um, Muslim they are they are majority. So um, also people do not know that much about Bangladesh. People only know that. Bangladesh you know because of textile and for another thing that is rape culture we have like a huge um huge problem with this um rape like uh according to a study every day four women or kid um experience rape and this is only statistics say this is only registered case there is also a lot of cases we do not know People often, 60% um, uh, they do not go to police and register. And um, I experienced sexual apartheid when I was a kid. As I said, I grew up uh, without my father, and I had to um, I had to experience a lot of sexual violence. It started from home, from from my neighbor. And um, then it was continued in my, my whole life, like in Bangladesh, in public transport, as a woman, you have to suffer every day. So when I was a kid, I had to experience with this and it, it continued my whole life. And um, also, if you wanna if you wanna do something different, like like I remember when I was a kid, I wanted to play cricket, but I wasn't not allowed to play cricket because this is this is only for male person. Also, like um, for for a study, for job, for for everything, as a woman, you have to fight in Bangladesh, and if you fight, people treat you like as a bad woman. If you want to study, if you wanna go outside big city. You are bad women. If you wanna uh, do not want to wear your scarf, you are bad women. So 
if you're divorcee, you are a bad woman. Like my mom, my father left us and my mom had to suffer her whole life and everyone is blaming her because my father left us. So my mom is a bad woman. That's why my father left us. So um, this is the short version um, of me. And also there is another big part in my life uh, Islam and me, Lily just mentioned I uh, about Surah 4. I remember when I was a teenager, I was a believer, you know. Then uh, I was curious that why people always say you cannot do these things, you cannot do these things because you are Muslim. Then I started to read Quran and when I read this Surah 4, I was like, wow, like, not anymore i was immediately i became an atheist so sometimes i thank quran sometimes i thank allah that okay um i am i'm an atheist and i'm proud of it so this is uh, my short version and uh, situation in bangladesh uh, i will uh, pass my mic to mila thanks thank you very much shami uh thank you for the timing and for the point that you mentioned i have a like couple of questions which I will ask on the second part, but thank you for your great speech. Uh, we move on to Varud Zahir. Uh, Varud is from Karbala, Iraq, and uh, I personally have attended a couple of uh, seminars Varud has already done, and we made an interview with Varud. Varud is awesome, basically. I know her for a couple of years, and actually, I, I'm a big fan of user uh, Varud personally. Thank Good you. Good to have you in this seminar. The floor is yours, Varud. Thank you, Milad. Yeah, my name is Baroud. I came from the heart of what they call Shia. And uh, I came from the oldest religious family that they made the religion for the, I don't know how to say it. They have the oldest uh, Islamic school in the Middle East, the oldest, Islamic library, all these books, and all this technique to manipulate people's minds with religion. So I was, I was really like lucky. I get out without like the consequences that caused to like this family to end my life inside Iraq because I am not the first female she ran away from them, but I am the first female she survived when she ran away from them or she escaped from them. Before I heard like in this family, there is female, they tried to escape and they did not um, uh, succeed. Uh, they, they've been killed in a mysterious way, most likely like a suicidal, they made it like a suicidal death, but it's like the family, they end their life. It's very heavy rules in this family because they are the nucleus of the Shia. They they are like, um, I mean the now what what like the religion Shia. This is what my family they made. Like I am like from this stem the tree. <laughs> so it was really horrible to stay with them, especially when you start to um see the things and you see the religion is just like a uh, human made uh to control people's minds very easy way and you start to realize how they are and how you are i mean when you want to shape your mind in this uh family you can't do it because they can i i don't know but they can feel you you start to change so the first time they, they, they start, like with me, at least, when I start to uh, get away from the religion or this toxicity of my mind because of the religion, I was the first time, like I was just questioning things, just like I was not really um, take everything serious when they say something to me, like genie, spirit, ghosts and I was like my mind was refused what they say and I was just questioning and it was like if you just question they told me God would really vanish me with the with the hell like it will 
burn me several times and he will uh, like uh, make a new skin and after that he also burned me then he made a new skin it was very horrible to <laughs> imagine like this god is very upset just because i am questioning things i'm not really believe in hi arena <laughs> hi she can't come with us arena is really good so um congrats having me you are such yeah. a strong one thank you <laughs> so uh and i was remember i was nine years old when i i was hearing um like um adhan and before the adhan there's some um uh, quotes that the um imam he was saying or sheikh he was saying and he says allah and his angels they pray on muhammad or the prophet muhammad and it was just like my mind was saying uh, to my mom she was like she they was made bread bread you know bread like a rakish bread something like this so and I just said, I said to my mom, because every time he said it, I said, is Muhammad, he prayed to God or God, you have to pray to Muhammad. I was really with a logical thing. And I just said to mom, my, my mom, I said to her, um, who will pray on Allah? Allah he prayed to Muhammad or Muhammad prayed to my mom? And suddenly like this, like it was, it, <laughs> she slapped me on my face and I was like totally shocked. It was just extreme because I just was like automatic question. It was just something very like, for me, it was very normal. Like, you know, when I ask, you can't um, uh, like uh, answer if you don't it's okay but like you somebody is love you just because you say something it was really for me it was like i was traumatized to be honest this is like the first time i was i was really scared every time i was like like um be attention do not uh, provoke the question when become in religion i don't provoke somebody i just ask in very like a uh, how to say shy shy um um words very shy and like please i just want to know like this i i i do i start to scared you know and it was like the the suspicious about this religion was become big and big like day after day i mean in teenage i start to really um doubt about everything in the religion everything because I, it was like we have a sectarian wars uh between sunni and shia and i was like i was just it's just this is very stupid this is very stupid why they are fighting on something we did not choose it was like this i was saying with myself i said i did not choose i just i just become like what they want me. I mean, I did not choose to be Shia or Sunni. Why they have to fight? Then I was like, I was read things. It was like normal. From 1,400 years, there is like a religious war or a sectarian war between Sunni and Shia. Mm -hmm. And I was like the first time I know this because, yeah. you know, even under Saddam regime, I know he's dictator leader but he was not like uh he was not uh teaching us in the school there was something about sunni and shia we don't know anything about these things it's like was like a secret topics nobody talk about these things mm -hmm. in our generation i mean yeah. so it was very scared like then i was like the first time um i just write something because i was see so much things it was very horrible and i just god definition in english language because i even when i was a muslim even when i was like i was so muslim like this with doubts of course in our religion i mean i was doubt about these sunni and shia problems but i was not really doubt like everything yeah yeah so i just i just write write it and it was like something about like 
uh, God idea is an idea and some people they believe in this idea and some people they don't believe in this and it was like I was really shocked there is like people I, I never thought there is like anyone in this earth because all the time we was keep going in this like there is no one in the earth he don't believe in God everyone he believe in God and I was really thinking this way and when that was very shocked to me and I was like how could they don't like how ca can somebody he just because you know God he made him and he just deny his exist this is very yeah, rude. can you please like, can you please summarize one minute left thank you <laughs> yeah make yes. it quick it yeah, was like very like... very weird for me I mean that was like uh, what what make me like uh, to go against religion because I think in our future there is not nothing about like religion that we have to fight like yeah. everybody had his own thinking this is what i think yeah thank you very much uh, thank you Verud. um it's always great to listen to your stories and your speech thank you very much uh the next speaker would be sargol i believe uh, sargol is from kurdistan if i'm not mistaken uh yeah. Sargon, the floor is yours uh now it's your turn to give you a speech okay uh hello everyone i'd like uh, congratulate you in my deepest heart for march 8 uh, the international women's day uh, and my name is Sargul Ahmed, uh, the coordinator of uh, women's liberation of iraq uh, when i was in iraq i was an uh, activist uh, and defined for uh, uh, women rights and children's rights uh, and uh, uh, after like i moved to uh, turkey uh, also in turkey i was uh, uh, working for uh, define the women's uh, refugee with the uh, uh, hcr and uh, now i am here in uh, toronto uh, also uh, i am a, a unit uh, b steward with the toronto education workers and uh, i am always participating with the uh, demonstrating for defining the women's rights. Uh, okay, uh, today I'm going to talk about sexual apartheid uh, in Iraq and Kurdistan regime. Uh, apartheid against a woman started through her childhood when she was born until she gets married and after married. So women are not considered a citizen. She is not considered uh, as a human. She has no personality, no dignity. And all uh, this born with the uh, atmosphere called uh, apartheid and sex separation. Before I go through this uh, issue, I'd like to share with you my short story. So uh, I was born in the, into a big uh, family. My mom raised five boys and eight girls. Unfortunately, four of uh, our my siblings was passed away. When I was listening to my uh, mom's story uh, about her pre uh, pregnancy with us uh, as a female and daughters, it, is, it was a tragic story. My mom told me that when I was born, we were living in southern Iraq, and she told me that how she got hurt emotionally and mentally by those uh, uh, women around her. Uh, they blame her, they look at her sad and angry, uh, just because uh, uh, only uh, because she got a, a baby girl. My mom wasn't happy and started crying and they told her uh, uh, antipathy, if we want, we want to throw her in the lake. And it was like uh, very hard for my mom and the, but uh, like, and the, but it wasn't happened like uh, because I was happy uh, and because of my dad, my dad was an amazing dad and uh, she showed his love uh, toward me and said to my mom, we got a beautiful daughter, no one can throw her into the lake. I, uh, I was named her Sargo, which is the uh, main top of the flower. By the way, I am proud of my dad, always and forever, because she never made a separation among uh, us uh, like uh, boys and girls. According to my story, I just wanted to say that 
the apartheid was created by the cultural and Asian idea and also the search of Islamic uh, law, which is feeding people and uh, brainwashing to produce uh, people like that. Then women cannot think uh, about uh, her rights and their uh, dignities. They are not uh, considered valuable. Unfortunately, this an ancient idea is still practicing under the name of uh, so-called civil law in Iraq. Women in Iraq have been suffering through uh, sexual apartheid uh, on the levels including but not limited to uh, society, family, law, state, and religion. Iraq, as one of the Arabic Islamic countries in the world, uh, is known for two, move, two movements uh, of nationalism and political Islam, which works to uh, segregate and oppress the women. They are both reactionary and discriminatory against women. And they are the uh, case root of the women's sexual apartheid in Iraq and many Islamic states as well. And now I'm going through all uh, lack of women's rights regarding education, marriage, sexuality, and their connection to the uh, Sharia law in Iraq. Regarding uh, their education, they don't have the same opportunity to voice resulting in vastly lower uh, percentage of uneducated women in the society in Iraq. Additionally, uh, a girl's personality does not develop uh, and uh, not gain uh, confidence because she doesn't have freedom uh, to choose the clothing, her friend is, where she can go and how to behave in a given situation. Also, they force her to wear hijab. Separation from boys in the school as it is taboo for uh, young girls and young boys to play together and study together. Consequently, teaching and illustrating the prohibition of sexuality between the two genders from such a young age results in confusion in how they should be or uh, in what a way to think. For mother, uh, before the young girl uh, has uh, completed school at the age of 16 or even, even younger, will be forced into an arranged marriage. So most of the girls committed suicide by burning or hanging themselves, unfortunately. In the past years ago, the Islamic movement in Iraq has attempted several times to force a Sharia law, so-called Jafari law, into the civic code. Uh, in this law, to force nine-year-old girls to be married, uh, and they want to continue to do uh, so today. This is a fast majority trade uh, to all girls and women in Iraq. Additionally to that, and according to the United Nations, 37.5% of Kurdish uh, girls' population in Iraq and Kurdistan Region, uh, region are forced to undergo female genital mutilation, which is part of the Sharia law. Another uh, crucial point is the right of choice in marriage has been taken away from the woman. Her guardian as a father, uncle, brother, grandfather, uh, deciding on her behalf how or when she is uh, uh, to be married to and she has no right to separation or divorce at all. And polygamy is a right uh, according in, uh, to law in Iraq. The man has the right to marry for women and at the same time also women uh, have to be submissive to her husband. Again, her rights are taken away on the her within night. When they find out uh, that she was not virgin, her family as well as uh, her, uh, the groom's family had the right to kill her. This is a considered honor killing. A woman is considered to be half of the value of man in the court as a witness and in inheritances of her family also. 
woman has no right to their body and it belongs to man. Therefore, they don't have the right to uh, abortion as well. One of the most tragic part of this apartheid is the kidnapping, raping, and trafficking of more than 5,000 Yazidi women by ISIS. Nadia Mur Murad is one of the victims who accept, uh, escaped uh, from the brutality of ISIS and has received a no Nobel Prize for her efforts uh, to end the use of sexual violence as a weapon to uh, segregate girls and women in Iraq. In regards to sexuality, sex out marriage is a crime in Islamic Sharia law. The punishment for uh, sex out marriage is uh, stoning to death. Since 1991, more than 20,000 of women murdered in honor killing in Kurdistan region stated by the United Nations. Just in 2019, 120 women have been killed in the Kurdistan region according to the official status. Hundreds of women have been killed by the Saddam Hussein's regime in the 80s uh, under the name of the Faith Campaign. And thousands have been murdered in the south cities of Iraq under the name of Shia Malika. After, uh, as uh, my friend, uh, where it come from. Currently, uh, thousands of women are faced with physical, emotional, and mental abuse. For example, if a woman uh, seeks employment, employers will demand her to provide sexual favors in order to be obtained for the job position. Additionally, women are uh, systematically harassed in the street. The men are encouraged by the tribunes of the mullah and the mosques. Besides this previous uh, point, beating and being held cap uh, captive are some examples of examples of domestic violence experience women in their home by hands of their family members. Many things can be said about women's sexual apartheid. However, it would take uh, up many pages of thousands of books uh, to reveal uh, the full pictures of women are suffering in Iraq. The situation is critical and it has provoked uh, hundreds of women activists all over Iraq and the Kurdistan region suffering a struggle, struggling for women's rights, rights and equality in spite of Islamic and Kurdish nationalist uh, mil militias working against those rights. And I'd like to mention the, re uh, the revolution on October 2020 in Iraq has changed the position and the role of women in society. Since the start of the movement, so women now have demonstrated and they are uh, as uh, capable as men to establish a civil and secular society. One important reason is thousands of women have joined the movement to end the Islamic national uh, sectarian rule. The October revelation is the light of the end of the dark tunnel uh, to end the apartheid uh, of women. Today we are preparing uh, ourselves for March 8 because this day is the particularly significant day to struggle and fight for women's rights. All the women in Iraq acknowledge that March 8 is a Women's Day as every year hundreds of women and men come to demonstrate on the street in many cities in Iraq and Kurdistan region as well as demonstrating their strength in fighting for their civil rights. So today we are one of the many women raising our voice for the full equality for women and long live March 8 long live uh, equality between men and women. Uh, thank you for your listening and your time.
Thank you very much, Sargol. It was great um, listening to you, what's happening in Kurdistan, Iraq, Middle East, general speaking. Thank you for your awesome speech. Uh, before we like move on to Mina Hadi, the last speakers of the first part of the panel, I would like to thank people participating in the live chat, Menno, Hassan, Arif, Mohammed, Pesarangin Kamoni, and some other people giving us comments. Thank you very much. And um, make sure that just like put comments, express yourself and ask questions. Mina gonna talk in German and she's gonna be the last speaker of the first part of this seminar. So Mina Hadi, great to have you here. The floor is yours. Then we're gonna go for the short break and then we start the second part of the seminar. Mina John, the floor is yours. Okay. Ähm, danke, ich bedanke mich sehr viel und ich bin sehr glücklich heute. Wir haben sehr ähm, gute ähm, Frauen eingeladen von verschiedenen Ländern aus Pakistan, aus dem Irak und aus Bangladesch. Äh, und ich denke, wir reden heute über ein sehr, sehr wichtiges Problem. Äh, soweit meine Person betrifft, ich komme aus dem Iran. Und ich habe schon im Iran als Kind auch gesehen, wenn Islam oder Allah sich einmischt in unser Leben, dann haben wir eine sehr, also sehr, sehr problematische Lage. Ich war äh, 13, 14 Jahre alt, habe ich angefangen mit Islam und mit Koran irgendwie auseinandersetzen. <lacht> Entschuldige, und ich habe schon entschieden, äh, Islam verlassen, als ich 14 Jahre alt war. Aber Nachher im Iran, Islam hat Macht gewonnen, Islamisten haben Macht gewonnen, 1979. Und seit 1979, ich kämpfe gegen eine politische Bewegung, politische Movement, die sehr, sehr wichtig war in unserem Leben. Zum Beispiel, ich habe schon gesehen, wenn Islamisten, wenn Allah, wenn Koran Macht gewinnt, dann haben wir mit einer reinen, Geschlecht Apartheid zu tun, mit Mord, Hinrichtungen und das haben wir schon im Iran gesehen. In erster Linie, wenn Islamisten Macht gewonnen haben, haben gegen Frauen gekämpft. Und ein sehr wichtiges Symbol oder ein sehr wichtiges Instrument war Hijab. Ich gehöre eine Generation im Iran. Ich habe zum Beispiel Medizin studiert damals und ich durfte auf die Straße gehen ohne Kopfsuch und arbeiten. Aber wenn Islamisten Macht gewonnen haben, dann haben gesagt, entweder Kopftuch oder schlagen wir euch. Wir waren tausende Frauen, wir, wir sind auf die Straße gegangen. Und ich möchte jetzt in meiner kurzen Rede hier betonen, Frauen zum Beispiel im Iran oder in Pakistan oder Afghanistan und andere Länder haben immer wieder gekämpft, zu Hause, auf die Straße und auch im Iran zum Beispiel. Wir waren tausende und tausende auf die Straße. Und haben wir gesagt, wir möchten gar keine islamische Regierung oder islamische Scharia. Und Frauenrechte sind nicht westlich oder östlich, sondern universal. Ich möchte hier also noch einmal betonen, es gab eine Revolution gegen Islamisten von Anfang an. Und unser Manifest war, dass Frauenrechte sind Menschenrechte und Frauen und Männer sind gleich. Und wir sind gegen diese Scharia und alles, was bedeutet. Aber wenn Sie meine Lebensgeschichte gucken, dann kann man schon auch genau sehen, wenn Islamisten Macht gewinnen, dann nicht nur Kopftuch, sondern Todesstrafe, Steinigung und sehr viele äh, Gesetze. Wir haben schon erlebt, zum Beispiel Trennung zwischen Männern und Frauen. Frauen dürften nicht mit Männern, zum Beispiel, wenn wir in einen Bus steigen möchten, wir mussten von hinter der Tür kommen, weil das war schon eine reine Geschlechtsapartheid im Iran. Aber auch dazu gehört sehr viele von meinen Freunden, Bekannte, also weil wir waren gegen diese islamische Regierung festgenommen worden, zum Beispiel mein Mann wurde hingekriegt oder auch sehr viele Freunde habe ich schon, Frauen, also die mit mir gearbeitet haben, das islamische Regime hat festgenommen und äh, vergewaltigt und dann hingerichtet. Also wir reden über jetzt, ich denke, das ist sehr wichtig, schon seit 42 Jahren, wir reden jetzt über eine politische Islam, politische Movement, politische Bewegung, die nicht nur im Iran, sondern im Irak 
gerade Kurdistan, Irak, Iran hat dort auch sehr viel Einfluss. Oder in verschiedenen Ländern, in Libanon. Äh, ah, und Karbala äh, und Nejef jetzt mit, mit der iranischen Regierung. Ja, genau. Also wir haben immer wieder mit islamischem Regime in verschiedenen äh, äh, Ländern zu tun. Aber wenn Islam Macht gewinnt, dann Frauen verlieren alles. Und genau in diesen Ländern haben wir mit einer Women-Revolution zu tun. Zum Beispiel im Iran haben wir gesehen, Frauen waren auf die Straße mehrmals und auch haben zum Beispiel die Frauen in Revolution, die Straße haben schon gegen Kopftuch sehr, sehr gut zum Beispiel eine Aktion gemacht und das war auch weltweit sehr bekannt. Ein, noch ein Punkt möchte ich hier darüber reden und das ist das, wir sind jetzt in europäischen Ländern und wir sehen immer wieder sehr viele Multikulturalisten, linksorientierte Organisationen, sehr viele Intellektuelle sind davor, dass zum Beispiel Kopftuch ist ein Recht für Frauen, sie verteidigen Kopftuch, sie kämpfen nicht gegen Geschlechtapartheit und auch europäische Regierungen machen mit, machen mit mit islamischem Regime im Iran oder in Pakistan und auch mit islamischen Verbänden in europäischen Ländern. Ich denke aber, es gibt große Bewegungen in sogenannte islamische Länder, es, es gibt atheistische Bewegungen, es gibt Frauen, die Islam verlassen oder Männer und es gibt auch Bewegungen für Freiheit, für ein besseres Leben und auch Frauenrechte. Wir müssen alle zusammentun. Das ist ein sehr wichtiger Punkt. Ist 8. März jetzt in zwei, drei Tagen und ich denke, unser Slogan, unser Wunsch ist das, wir müssen alle zusammenarbeiten, wir müssen gegen Geschlechtsapartheit auf die Straße gehen und auch, das ist sehr wichtig, wir müssen alle europäischen Länder unter Druck setzen, auch deutsche Regierung und auch ähm, also weltweit, dass diese Regierungen sollen nicht mit äh, Regierungen oder Parteien oder Organisationen die Geschlechtsapartheit verteidigen, zusammenarbeiten. Also ich verlange von EU zum Beispiel islamische Regime, politisch boykottieren, weil äh, schwarz auf weiß haben dort geschrieben, Frauen sind nicht gleich mit Männern und Steinigung ist ein Gesetz und alles. Alle Regierungen, die so etwas machen, auf meine Sicht sollen schon also in eine Liste äh, gehen, dass die, diese islamische oder diese barbarische Regierungen muss man boykottieren, muss man dagegen sein und das ist auch sehr, sehr wichtig. Also am Endeffekt, ich bin sehr glücklich. Heute habe hab ich sehr, sehr gute Reden gehört und ich wünsche, dass wir alle zusammenarbeiten und irgendwie ein Netzwerk gründen in verschiedene sogenannte islamische Länder, dass wir alle zusammen noch mehr tun und noch mehr Änderung in unser Leben bringen. Dankeschön. Thank you very much, Mina. Uh, vielen Dank. <laughs> If my German is not that bad. <laughs> uh, thank you for the speech. Um, Uh, I, actually, I can see some questions uh, from the audience says all the questions are saved. I'm going to ask the question on the second part of the seminar. Uh, thank you all for being patient. It's like one hour. We're running the seminar. We're going to have a, like a very short break, two minutes video. I'm going to play and then uh, we're going to start the second part. Uh, I have some questions. And as you guys see, there are some questions by the audiences, which I'm going to ask during the second part meanwhile let's just watch this video that been made um by the central committee of ex-muslim in scandinavia a couple of years ago for the women's day just give me a second yes i guess that's the one Thank <laughs> you. 
back to the seminar uh, I think you cannot see me so I'm just gonna change it yeah uh, we're gonna start the second part of the seminar if I can just adjust the yeah I think that's better uh, we, we're gonna start the second part of the seminar I have a couple of questions uh, which I'm gonna ask um, and then I'm gonna ask the question audiences has like rise and during the first part of the seminar and then um, every panelist would have the chance to talk uh, show disagreement or agreement during this speech. So feel free to talk. Your microphone would be open and just talk and just express yourself in the way that you would like to. The first question I have here is from Lilith, which was our first speaker. Uh, Lilith, uh, you talking about you talk about the like verses, special verses in Quran, um, saying like you know trying to prove that like you know according to Quran, uh, Islam is like anti really anti. Uh, women sort of religion, I would say. Um, to disagreement with your statement, we know some people saying um, you gotta like, you know, consider Quran uh, in the historical, uh, basically, content. Uh, during the time Quran was, um, was used by the Prophet Muhammad, uh, the situation of the society was like very male-based. So Islam and Quran for those times were sort of like a modern sort of ideology. But it cannot be really, really it be it cannot be implemented to the like a recent world. They're saying like Islam has a soul, and the soul of Islam doesn't have anything against the women. You're not supposed to go and like find the chapters uh, and then try to prove that Islam is anti-women. What would you be your answer? Uh, do you believe Islam has a soul and the soul of Islam is not against women? Um, thank you for the question. Um... I would like to uh, quote here one of the Australian youth activists. Um, I think her name was, uh, is, if yeah, she's still there, Yasmin Abdul Majid. Yeah. And three years ago, she was on the ABC News and she said that according to her, Islam is the most feminist religion in the world. And my uh, point to that is, uh, when we uh, read surahs, uh, especially the, the surahs of uh, Quran, which are about Allah, everywhere it says, Kul huwa Allah ahad. It could also say, Kul hiya Allah ahad. So those people who don't understand Arabic, huwa is for male person and hiya is for a female person. So if Islam is that much of a feminist religion, Allah could have been a female goddess. Why Allah has to be uh, denominated or uh, prescribed uh, by the Arabs as a male person or a male deity and used male pronouns. So that's just one example. Then we talk about, about the things that, oh, you know, there is, the women were buried alive when they were born. And you know that Islam gave so much power to the uh, women. It gave all the rights to the women. My question is, uh, where are those rights being practiced? I have quoted all the uh, surahs and their verses where women are explicitly said to be less than men. So if Islam is feminist, and feminism also means that uh, women and men are equal, uh, or all genders are equal uh, in today's, uh, I would say, definitions. Uh, why don't we see it in Quran anywhere? I'm not even going to talk about Sharia because when people talk about Sharia, they are going to uh, once again put in the Ahadith and the Sira of the Prophet. So I'm not going into that. I'm just keeping very close to the things that were written during the lifetime of the Holy Prophet of Islam. I don't see that. I have read Quran. I have studied Quran. I don't see it anywhere. It's 
deliberately uh, making women uh, independent on men. Uh, sex slavery was not abolished. Uh, why wasn't it abolished? Um, why were there captive women also the, the possession of your hands uh, kept in, in uh, uh, so, so under caliphs as well as other Muslims? So you would invade a tribe, take their women and their children, make them your slaves, and then say we are the most feminist religion in the world? Is like, do, do people think when they are talking about such kind of uh, argumentation? Uh, the last thing that I would like to say, if women are equal in Islam, why is not imamat given to women? Why are there no prophets in uh, the Islamic or before pre-Islamic era? There were prophetesses in Arab pagan world, but there were no prophetesses or there were no imams in the later Islamic world. So there were oracles uh, who used to speak to God directly in the Greek uh, times and in the Greek periods. Where are the oracles in Islam? Do you see any oracle? If a woman just goes and uh, do the imamat, that is, she leads a prayer for uh, men and women equally, she is immediately uh, called a blasphemous woman. So there, there is another thing that I would like to ask, I would uh, like to add later, um, that has a lot to do with the Christianity as well, because the Islam that we see today, it was maybe not the Islam that was practiced 300 or 400 years ago, but uh, the Islam was never as does Christianity, as does Judaism, as is Hinduism, and all other religions who are all male-based religions. So uh, that's Lily. like, it's, it's so much of apartheid in all these religions, and then we are coming up with the arguments that it's a feminist religion. I'm sorry. Yeah, you, you're absolutely right. But what I'm saying is like, um, these these are the points that you mentioned goes back to 1400 years ago and those times they were kind of like you no know, vanguard sort of beliefs uh today of course we have like a feminism and stuff but they what they're saying is not my point of view i'm just asking questions mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um they're saying like we can i mean there are some researchers like islamic researchers uh, they study in the uk or like in the west europe in the universities they're saying like we can have like a modern Islamic feminism, which um, like, and, and we, can be, we can be sure that like these modern uh, Islamic rituals can like, uh, can, can protect women from the like a, like a Asian sexism against women. What do you think about this sort of new beliefs? Do you think like Islam can be women's friendly somehow according to these new researchers? Um I would say then they have to change the um, the verses in the Quran. That's the that's my one one line answer. Or uh, they will have to change it. Yeah. And they will have to interpret it very differently. And they will have to make maybe God a genderless God. And they would also have to put out all the verses which say the women have half the uh, authority of being a witness as a man, half the inheritance as a man, and then that the women have less power than the men. Like we have al uh, kawamunu al nisai The men have a degree higher above Arrijal kawamun al nisa Arrijal kawamun al nisa So so sorry, Arabic is not my mother tongue. So so, so it's like these kind of verses, if you are going to believe that Islam can be reinterpreted, then you have to take these verses out. Can you do that? Can you have a King James version of Quran? No. When you talk to Muslims, it doesn't matter if they are Shia, if they are Sunni, if they are any sect. All of them believe on one thing is that Islam, uh, sorry, Quran uh, is not corrupted. It was never changed. And it can never be changed, and it is for all eternity. All right, so thank you. We have to uh, this, uh, also. this idea. Yeah, yeah. Uh, like Pasarangi Kaman is asking, can it be said that Islam is inherently anti-women? Yes or no? Lilith, I'm asking you. Can you yeah. answer this question? Can it be said that Islam is inherently anti-women? Mm, I would say yes. Yes, all right. I just want to like you know point out the audience's question. Thank you very much, Lilith. Uh, I'm back to you again. Um, basically, as I said, 
uh, all the panelists feel free to cooperate and like express yourself during this speech my next question goes to shami uh shami you mentioned like the things happening in bangladesh uh, the question would be why you think it's important to talk about the things happening in country like Bangladesh. As you said, the official religion in that country is not Islam, but we still see like a segregation and like sexism somehow in the country. Why is it important that people like you, girls like you, talk about the situation they're facing in a country like Bangladesh? Because if we don't talk, it will not stop because in Bangladesh, there is another part about freedom of speech. There is a lot of blasphemy law. If you write, if you talk, if you criticize Islam, if you criticize government, they, they arrest you. There's also a couple of blogger and writers there in prison. Um, I mentioned you, um, I just mentioned in the beginning that one of the writer just died in, the, in jail because he criticized government. So in Bangladesh, we cannot talk about it that much. Still, people are trying, people are writing on social media, people blogging, but um, we should talk like internationally, we should talk more about the situation in Bangladesh so that people know about it internationally, we can do something for, uh, for women uh, in Bangladesh. And also, um, as I said, people do not know that much about Bangladesh, only about this textile or about this now Rohingya crisis, refugee crisis in Bangladesh. But um, uh, also Bangladesh is not an Islamic country. So people think uh, the situa situation of women, it's, it's um, not so bad. But um, if you see the statistics of, of this rape victims, it's horrible. So that's why we should talk about it and we should be more loud and i yeah. should i should admit also that now this time uh, the situation women women are more bold and loud so there is a lot of demonstration protest people are women are trying to uh, protest against of this even against of this law so it's changing so they need solidarity they need allyship a strong allyship so that's yeah. why it could talk about Bangladesh. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I get another question. You mentioned that the women that fights for her right in Bangladesh is labeled as a bad woman. Yeah. Why is it that? Why? I mean, there is like a somehow a negative view against the women who fighting for her rights. Yeah, because because um, the society is male dominated. So as women, good women, what is the good definition of typical good women? Be quiet listen what your father say brother say or your husband better stay at home if you want to study yes you can maybe but you should dream your the purpose of a study is getting married and um, good women do not uh, do not uh, go for work after marriage good women take care yeah. of her um, husband so if you break all those things they then call you, bad you a slut. They call you bad women. Like my whole life, one one word I heard. Like I do not know how many times. Like in Bangla, Magi. I do not know. Also in in um, Urdu, uh, it's also called Magi. I do not know, uh, Lilith. So so I had to hear this word. It means slut. My whole life, mm -hmm. from my neighbor, relatives, friends on the street, everywhere, because I was loud. I was bold. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, actually, I was just, I know there are like some activists, they use that phrase proudly slut, I think. Uh, exactly. That, uh, yeah, it's good to be a slut. I mean, slut means like yes. a revolutionary somehow. Exactly, somehow. I'm proud of it. And whenever whenever people <laughs> talk, you know, that uh, make gossip, you know, this women in Bangladesh, she, she's not so good girl. She's did this. Whenever I heard this word, immediately I think maybe she did something uh, bold, you know, good thing. That's why they call her that she's yeah. not women so of yeah. course i'm proud of it to be a slut and i we want to be a slut nice nice thank you awesome awesome to hear that uh thank you I, i'm gonna ask the next question from mariam uh, i'm gonna ask one of the questions that audience has made mm -hmm. uh, which was sort of interesting what's the role of hijab in discriminating and apartheid against women um i think it's a it's a restrictive choice of clothing uh because i sort of uh, in my online online presence, did did an experiment where a woman 
is taking hijab but she is using instead of a normal cloth she is she is using a towel and then wearing that towel she is saying uh, anti um, like things that are not considered modest or that are not considered normal in in a patriarchal uh, social uh, conditioning and then obviously i was called uh, also called a slut for that so many times so that particular experiment of sorts which is still going on was to prove that this one idea of hijab is actually very restrictive in it intrinsically it, it it doesn't matter if you say that oh i i take it and i am still doing whatever i want to do and you're still free and you still can but it, it, it's it's it, it i i would say it's a total lie because um once you start taking it you have to adhere to so many social uh, and religious norms uh, you can't um, let's say uh, then i mean there is also a category of women who are taking a certain type of hijab that is not exactly supposed to be uh, that is not exactly acceptable in a very traditional uh, or sharia sharia and then uh, there is a another section of women who are actually calling those hijab taking women also sluts because then okay yeah you are taking hijab then why why is your butt showing why i can still see your skin why are you wearing clothes which shows the shape of your body so um, yeah that yeah. that would be my answer okay. to that the next question would be um as i mean you explained the role of hijab in like uh, discrimination against women what do you think uh of the role of hijab in the west countries like in country like germany sweden the country i'm living in this country is like you know by law hijab is not forced to anyone uh, some women choose to have hijab what do you think about the role of hijab in the west in terms of segregation and sexism against women well uh, i mean coming from uh, uh, coming from a country like pakistan i know so many families um, uh, who are second or even third generation um, expats they're living either in germany or either in uk or somewhere else in europe but i can show you that majority of those families still uphold same social norms as they do uh, in pakistan actually a tad actually a level higher than that because then somehow they want to compensate for not being um, in a religious or a, like for 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 living in a let's say um, non muslim uh, country so people so women who are here and they insist on taking it n- number one they 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 are not in, uh, i would say that they are not entirely fam- familiar with the or or they are in a certain cocoon or a privileged position where they don't know actually what it means and what it what it does to so many and majority of other women in uh, all over the world in muslim communities and um, secondly the ones who take it and they say that yeah we are free of taking it again i would not entirely believe that narrative because uh, even when you are free of taking it then how come it is that when you take it off there is so much backlash and you can't take it off very easily have, have yeah. you ever seen a woman taking it off and then her family clapping for her and saying yeah okay you did a great job it's fine do whatever you want to do no it, it, it never happens when that happens then maybe i can say that it's your it was your choice yeah thank you thank you um uh, i'm going back to you later uh varud i'm going to have a questions um from you i mean uh i know the story of your life and you just mentioned some part of it during the first part of the seminar you said like you actually were supposed to face so many violence like physical violence being beaten only because you ask some questions about quran allah and islam and some other things why you think there are so much violence against people like you uh, for the crime of asking i mean you would just ask some questions and just think about some root of islam and you had to be faced like a brutal violence uh, against yourself and i think that's the story of many other people like you why there are so much violence against like a person like you yeah well uh, because they think we are threatening islam exactly because we will like um, uh, 
We will lead people to shirk, which means like uh, we will uh, make people suspicious and make people like uh, leaving Islam by our suspicious. So they have a strategy, to be honest, that if somebody he will just like, you know, in mafia, Islam is like mafia. If you just get out from the mafia, they will not leave you in peace because yeah. you will expose the what they do, the rules of the this mafia, the secrets of, of this what they do you know because every family uh, they have their own violence against their kids to teaching them islam islam is never was like a peaceful teaching it was like violence teaching with the threatening all the time with hell this is like the uh, like the least thing the leastest things that they do with you like they said if you don't do that if you don't listen to us you will burn in hell for eternity it's very scary things i mean your entire life as a child you get threatened like from your father mother your family i mean even it was like my aunt it was like my mom she would start to make my aunt against me like oh, if you do something like this the hell all the time this lectures of the hell and banishment from the god if i don't listen to them yeah if I do something really? what we need, uh, like uh, and it was like they there is a uh, physical violence also i have now a spinal cord injury because what what what, what they did with me i mean it's not easy the question, would be, the question mm -hmm. would be why all this violence is like a double if it comes to a woman who disobey or like ask question against islamic rules uh, shami mentioned that um they call they call you uh, a bad woman if you ask question or if you do something against the religious and the traditions rules why such a brutality is like a more and like a double size or like a 10 times more against women rather than men you think yeah, well, uh, I have the same story with the Shami. I mean, we don't have Maggie. We, they, they said to us, Gahba, Gahba was dead at the beach. So I always hear it also. Uh, so it's like the same story. But uh, because uh, we are carrying the owner of the family, the owner, which means like uh, if the female, she did anything that like, goes against the Islamic rules in the family, she will brow the shame for her entire family like not just entire your family entire your tribe not your just entire your tribe entire your like uh whoever he just like connect to you imagine now in iraq they said she brought like when i read some comments on my youtube channel they said she brought the 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 shame for the entire country now i am not just brought for my family or my 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 like we called ashira which is a tribe our tribe no uh, from the both side no i just brought entire country now it's a shameful because what i did imagine how we are really powerful like when some someone like us you know female she ran away from this society she really will be like a, a, like a, how to say um a lesson for another female she said, oh, she did it. I can did it also to escape this uh, brutal family. They know that, I mean, everybody that, in our uh, culture, they know what they do with us. It's wrong. But, you know, instead they, they fix their problems. What they say? They said, if you go, you, you your story will be like this female. She's been killed. You know, we have so many females that have been killed. They try to escape. They kill. So... They make us like uh, they want to enslave us by fear, you know, not mm -hmm. like by he, he, they can't talk and they can't fix our problem. They can be like more free or liberal. No, they become more worst and they become like to make us think this is our destiny. If I run away, if I escape, that's why, you know, everyone in this like male um, uh, from our country or our societies, they try to kill us like to say this is your destiny when you just run away from the family rules by the way even here in in germany there is some from those men they believe in this they said i was reading some comments they 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 living here in germany 
some Middle Eastern men, Muslim men, they said, somebody have to chasing her to kill her because she will, she will make other females run away from us. Imagine, imagine this. They, 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 they write in this a comment. They, they pleasing anyone from like this, those male, um, the Muslim male to like see me and kill me. So not to make other females to be like me, you know, free and like this is to really scare them. Like free women is real, like the the, the most nightmare for, for a, a Muslim family, yeah. especially for the Muslim men that a female should run away and she successfully live her life without her uh, family rules, the religious rules, traditional rules like this. Yeah, for me, actually, the name of Karbala uh, used to just come with Imam Hussein and some other like a Shia ceremonies. Now Karbala to me means Varud Zahir. So I think you sh they should be proud of you, not just be like, you're Thank not ashamed, you. you're a hero. Thank you so much. I don't know Karbala. how to say. Thank Karbala you. Has a new label, as a new name. Cool. Thank you. Uh, Sargul, uh, I would like to, uh, to ask another question. You mentioned the role of Islamists in the Middle East, in Kurdistan, in Iraq. Uh, like how you how important you evaluate the law the the, the role of uh, political Islam uh, to empower Islamists and to put women on the on the sexism and like sex uh, segregation. Just talk about this political Islam a bit. How important is it to empower Islamists against the majority of people, specifically women? Yeah, uh, I think uh, this is. Uh, uh... I think uh, I mentioned before uh, the power of the Islam in the uh, in the Iraq, and uh, I think uh, the majority in the Middle East. Uh, the uh, it is uh, the system, the system which system is uh, uh, practicing in these uh, uh, countries, uh, uh, and uh, uh, as I mentioned, the, the nationalism uh, they uh, brought. Uh, for example, in 1991, when Saddam is uh, uh, um, go and uh, uh, in our like region, Kurdistan region, the Kurdish uh, nationalist uh, parties came to the power, and they opened they opened the door for the uh, Islamic groups to and give them the power, and they uh, uh, like they uh, share with them everything like. In a state like that time, I was there. I was working for the uh, protecting children a center. I opened a center for protecting children. I was uh, talking about the uh, uh, children's right, uh, like uh, such as uh, 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 because they practicing beating kids and uh, uh, sending kids for the for mosques and. Uh, uh, brainwashing, uh, like, and we have uh, like a dozen of the cases that kids uh, uh, get a mental uh, problem. And uh, I was talking about those issues in the TV, but they uh, right away from the government, uh, the nationalists, they closed uh, uh, our program uh, and uh, they didn't uh, support us. They give uh, all the money for the like uh, Islamic group. And uh, uh, I want to mention uh, something like uh, uh, Islam, like Muslim people, like uh, as a religion, all the religion, it is like something, it sees it's okay for people practicing as a, like uh, uh, there uh, to uh, like calm down themselves. But if it's become like a political uh, Muslim and they want to force something on me, that's not acceptable. And I tried on my uh, like life as a woman, and I, uh, as uh, uh, other my friends uh, mentioned about that, that's not uh, like why uh, I am not equal with my brother. I have all like acknowledged. I am. Uh, uh, I think uh, I am a be better than them. And uh, uh, why I am not equal with him? I I have to ask this question and. Uh, uh, if the woman a uh, little bit think about those uh, writers, they should not uh, follow the uh, those uh, rulers like Islamic believers. Uh, and uh, uh, this is one thing I I want to mention. Like uh, um, a few months ago, in a small uh, 
like uh, in the city of Halabja, is the border with the Iran, uh, the Islamic group, like they uh, forced the hijab for uh, 130, I think uh, 137 uh, young girls. They put a hijab and they said this is their choice. But no, that's not choice. Not this is, has uh, like something behind. If you yeah. look at this uh, date, it is equal with the like uh, uh, Iranian, uh, like uh, uh, Iran, uh, uh, Islamic Republic of Iran is uh, come to the power. Yeah. Uh, the next question would like be... Some political behind this. Precisely. Uh, behind the next question the, would be... Yeah, yeah. I mean, just last sentences, because I would like to ask another question to you. And like, we have a short and last. So you can finish if you like. Last sentence. No, that's okay. You can go ahead. Yeah, yeah. All right. Thank you. Uh, the next question would be like, how you? I mean, how important you evaluate the policy of the West? Uh, the the political Islam um, actually got the power over the past decades in the Middle East, and I know, I and mean, we know, like the Western countries, like for example, German government, mm -hmm. like Swedish EU, generally speaking, and the U.S. government, they support actually and stand on the side of the political Islamists. How important you evaluate you evaluate the policy of the West regarding the political Islam? Yeah, uh, I think it's the other like issue: uh, multiculturalism, multiculturalism in the Europe and uh, uh, like Canada, uh, other countries. It's the one uh, issue that they make. Uh, uh, they allow the Islamic group. Uh, uh, to have uh, uh, like practice uh, their uh, uh, activities. Uh, for example, they let them open mosques and they have a, uh, and they let them to send the uh, children to go the, uh, to the uh, mosques. And it's not uh, it's uh, uh, against the right uh, for uh, children. And they when uh, uh, and I know we have like so many uh, girls was. Uh, mothered and the, by the hand of their family members in in western uh, countries uh, for example in canada like uh, aksa parwes uh, some this is uh, one girl uh, she was um, she's a young girl only uh, 16 years uh, old uh, from her family forced her to wear hijab but when she went to the school in the subway uh, she changed uh, her hijab to modern clothes, but her father, uh, her father and dad, uh, they know they knew about that, and uh, they kill her. And when we are going to talk about this issue, and from the system of this uh, Eastern country, they said, "Oh, this is their beliefs. They pra uh, practice this. Like maybe uh, why they provide all the." Uh, uh, powers for them in this uh, Western. Unfortunately, we uh, uh, escaped from those uh, ancient, uh, like, uh, 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 system. We came here and still we see those uh, discrimination in here against women. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Mina Hadi, I'm going to ask you uh, the question that most of the audiences ask. What is the solution? What should we do? regarding the segregation against women. Um, I'm hoping you understand what I'm saying. Uh, you can answer in German. And uh, I think that would be the last question for this seminar. What's the solution, Mina? OK. Thank um, you. Thank you. I think we must do something. And maybe the first point is that we must talk about this problem. Reden. Diese Veranstaltung ist für mich sehr wichtig, weil zum Beispiel wir arbeiten hauptsächlich, ich komme aus dem Iran und ich arbeite mit iranischem Publikum oder Frauen und reden wir nur über Frauenproblematik im Iran. Andere kommt aus anderen Land und dann redet auch zum Beispiel über Pakistan. Aber wenn wir alle zusammen sitzen, dann sehen wir, haben wir gleiche Probleme. Und wir können auch zusammen sehr viel tun. Ich denke, diese Veranstaltung war für mich sehr wichtig, weil ich höre immer wieder Frauen aus Sudan, aus Algerien, 
aus äh, verschiedenen Somalien und verschiedenen Ländern. Wenn wir alle zusammen sitzen und reden, dann sehen wir, wir haben mit Geschlecht Apartheid und diese Geschlecht Apartheid hat sehr viel zu tun mit politischer Islam, Islamisten und auch Islam als eine Religion. Wenn Sie mich fragen, alle Re Religionen sind gegen Frauen. Aber Islam ist besonders gegen Frauen und jetzt ist auch eine politische Movement mit Mord, mit Hinrichtungen, mit Terror, mit Gefängnissen, mit Regierungen. Wir haben zu tun und genau deswegen erster Punkt ist, dass wir müssen reden über diese Problem. Wir müssen zusammenarbeiten und auch wir müssen auf die Straße gehen. Wir müssen unsere Gesicht zeigen. Ich sage nur kurz einen Punkt. Liebe Leute, die diese Film sehen oder jetzt online sind, die Frauen, die hier sitzen, jede hat eine Lebensgeschichte. Die sind sehr mutige und sehr, sehr wichtige Frauen, ich, auf meine Sicht. Und genau deswegen ist sehr, sehr wichtig, dass mehrere Frauen, in, die in verschiedenen Ländern kämpfen und jeden Tag auf die Straße gehen oder mit eigenem Leben, also diese, diese Kampf weitermachen, dass wir eine Plattform bieten, alle diese Frauen, also kommen und sich zeigen. Und auf anderer Seite, ich denke, wir müssen zum Beispiel alle europäische Regierungen unter Druck setzen. Das ist eine Schande für die deutsche Regierung, dass in verschiedenen Medien immer Frauen mit Kopftuch unterwegs sind und Frauen, so wie Wurut oder Lilith und andere Frauen, wenig Möglichkeit bekommen, in Massenmedien gehen. Das ist nicht richtig. Ich verlange von deutscher Regierung klipp und klar sagt, Kopftuch ist Kinderrechtsverletzung zum Beispiel. Kopftuch muss verboten werden. Kinder haben keine Religion und so weiter. Also Zentraler der ex muslime möchte so etwas. Am Endeffekt möchte ich noch einmal betonen, wir müssen schon auf die Straße gehen, Gesicht zeigen und politisch sehr viel aktiv sein. Danke, Milad. Thank you very much. Thank you, Minajan. Uh... I totally understand you, but sorry about my German. My German. I cannot talk German. Hopefully in future, I, I can remember some of my German. Lilith, you would like to say something, please. Uh, so this, to this question, like, what is the solution? I always say there is just one solution. Whenever we are doing policy making, we have to include women from all backgrounds, first of all. And secondly, the policy making should never include any religion. That's it. You are going to make a policy about anything, about studies, about health, about your day-to-day -day public life, about your private life. It should be based on the universal human rights and not on rights of religion. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lilith. Awesome. Thank you, everyone. Um, I think that's the end of the seminar. Uh, I would like to thank you again, all of you, Vurud, Mina, Shami, Mariam, Sargo, Lilith. Thank you all uh, for being here and for your great speeches. And also to the audiences who watch the program live, I think up to 100 people watch it live through the platforms. Uh, the program was broadcasted, which is a decent number. Thank you all. Um, we're going to have another seminar on March the 7th. Uh, make sure that you don't miss that seminar as well milad rasai managed thank you all and best wishes for all of you lovely people thank you <laughs>